All right, we are back to PAX for the last time. I cannot believe we're finally all the way through this book. Um, so I hope you're ready for the end. Um, I'll just be quiet and not spoil anything. Um, but thinking about back to what has happened before, last time we read on Friday, um, Pax is in a very precarious, dangerous situation with Bristle and Runt. There is a coyote that has followed Runt's blood trail from his wounds, and he is intent on finding Runt. So Bristle and Pax are doing their best to keep this coyote away. And Peter has been dropped off from the bus. He is making his way through the woods. He passed the soldier. He's into the military fighting zone. And the last thing, he just screamed Pax because he dug up the tiny soldier that he'd thrown to begin this whole story. Okay? All right. Now, he did also find the fox leg. So he doesn't know if that leg is Pax's or not. Um, and while he was burying that is when he found the soldier. And that is where we ended. Chapter 31. Pax reached the tree just as the coyote sprang again, this time finding enough purchase to hang from the branch. Pax flew at him and bit a mouthful of bridled fur and hung on. The coyote dropped and sank his teeth into Pax's shoulder, all in one motion. Pax jerked free and then back toward the south edge of the clearing, hoping to lead the coyote away from the tree, away from the den, away from the foxes he loved. The coyote didn't follow. He threw back his head and barked. Then he turned to eye Bristle again. Pax lowered himself and began to creep back toward the tree, but then he stopped. He swung his head around toward a sound from the encampment. His boy's voice? Ahead, the tall coyote barked again, and this time the call was answered. Three sets of ears cocked at the same spot in the juniper ring. A second coyote trotted out, another male, this one pale and stocky. He surveyed the scene and broke into a gallop for the tree. Bristle issued another threat, yowl, and spiked her fur, but Pax saw her eyes roll in terror. The second coyote pawed at the trunk, and then Pax heard it again. His boy, calling his name. He bolted out of the clearing and through the stand of trees. At the ridgeline above the mill, he stopped. War-sick men streamed from the walls, sticks raised, converging on a figure down on the field. It was a black-haired youth, curled on the burned ground. His boy? The wind blowing from the north told him nothing. The soldiers stopped, their sticks still menacing. The boy rose. He was tall. But Pax saw that his boy didn't look like, that this boy didn't look like Peter's. This boy's shoulders were thrown wide and braced under one narrow pole. Stranger still, this boy held his head high, not canted downward. He faced the men in defiance something Pax had never seen Peter do, and raised his fist and shook it at them. A single soldier ran down to the field. This one moved like his boy's father. He shouted, and the voice was familiar. But then the man walked to the boy and embraced him, something Pax had never seen the father do. Were these his humans? Pax tried to scent, but the gusting breeze carried only the musk of enraged coyotes. He turned back for the clearing. All right, that's the end of that chapter. We are going to read on. What does that tell us that Pax, you know, he's wanted to see Peter this whole time, wanted nothing more than to see his boy and protect him. Now that he thinks he sees his boy and his father, he turned back to the clearing to save the foxes. What do you think this means? Is Pax beginning to feel more wild than tame? I, I wonder. Chapter 32. Peter let his father hug him. For so many years, he had wanted to be in that circle of protective love. He felt his father quake with sobs, and he wanted to reassure him that everything was all right. But it wasn't. His hand stayed clenched, one on, the one on the crutch grip, one on the toy soldier. He pulled away. What are you doing here? You told me you would only be laying wire. And then he understood everything at once. Why the men hadn't advanced how the grasses had been burned and the trees uprooted and the river strangled with rocks, how there could be nothing left of a fox but a single leg. You knew. He shoved the toy soldier into his pocket and picked up the fox leg. You knew. You did this. Pax. Staff, there is pizza in the break room if you guys are hungry. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
It's not going to work out for me, huh? Chapter 33. Again, Pax thought he heard his boy's voice. He pricked his ears back to the camp. Just then the wind shifted. Pax smelled the war sick sweat, their cordite, their mo motor fuel, their charred fields, and his two humans. He ran back to the ridge. He saw his boy lift something from the ground, a stick, but not a stick, something furred and broken. The grief yearning scent rolled up the hill, fresh and keen from his boy, but also old and strained from his boy's father. So this scent was not Peter's alone, it was the scent of humans. His boy held the broken thing above his head and cried something angry, and then Pax, and Pax barked. Chapter 34 Peter held what was left of the fox high above his head and called his name again. Pax! And from above the mill, an answering bark. Hope rose in his throat, but no, he must have just wished for that bark. He scanned the ridgeline anyway, a flash of red, a white-tipped brush. A fox appeared in an open spot and rose on his back legs, on two back legs, and looked straight at him. Peter pressed the fox leg into his father's hand. Bury this! Then he grabbed his other crutch and turned for the hill. Wait, Peter, you have to understand. It's my duty. Peter pointed to the fox on the ridge. He thumped his chest so hard it hurt. That's mine. Saying that's his duty, right? His fox. His father shouted to him about wires. He shouted him to stop. Peter saw the wires. He pulled over them, but he did not stop because there was only his fox waiting on the spine of the hill and the distance between them. Over and over, he planted his crutches and swung through, closing the distance. When he was almost there, his shirt dried from the wind and then soaked again in sweat. He stopped and called. Pax tossed his head and then bounded away toward the trees, on four legs. Peter was sure of it. Pax was unharmed. Peter followed, but again, just as he neared him, Pax broke away, galloping into the trees. Peter followed again. He didn't begrudge Pax this testing game. He had broken his pet's trust. Why wouldn't he be skittish? Why wouldn't he need to assure himself of Peter's loyalty now? For as long as Pax wanted, Peter would obey. It was fair punishment. Through the trees, a hundred yards, a hundred yard, sorry, a hundred long yards and a hundred more, Peter followed. And then they broke into a clearing and the fox stood and waited. Peter reached him. He offered his hand. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Pax locked Peter's gaze and then took his wrist in his jaws. Peter's pulse jumped against the bracket of teeth, pressed just tight enough to claim him, just tight enough to call to Peter's own wildness, two but not two. Pax released Peter's wrist and tore across the clearing toward a crooked tree. Circling the tree was a pair of coyotes. Pax lunged at the taller one. No, Pax, come back! The tree was so far away, 50 yards at least. Peter dug his crutches into the turf and picked hard. When he was a dozen yards away, he saw the coyote's teed quarry. Another fox, bright furred with a sharp and delicate face, a vixen. She was bleeding from a gash on her haunch, and instead of a thick brush, th she thrashed the blackened whip of her tail. The vixen swiped at one of the coyotes from above, taunting it, and Pax snapped at the other's flank. Peter saw that the two foxes were a team and that they were no match for the coyotes. Peter barreled for the tree, shouting, but the coyotes ignored him. The taller of the two spun around and sank their teeth into Pax's neck. Pax shrieked, and Peter roared in fury. He braced himself on one crutch and leaned back and side-armed the other, heavy with its wide ash bat, as hard as he could, aiming in between the two coyotes. Both of them wheeled around at the outrage. While the tree rang with the bat's blow, the tall dark one sprinted away and disappeared into the brush. The other one bolted a dozen yards and then stopped and turned back. He eyed Peter and bared his fangs. Peter bared his teeth back. Pax growled at his side, hackles raised, ready to spring. Peter swept his second crutch over his head and roared again, and Pax snarled, and the pale coyote reared back in surprise. He turned and crashed out of the clearing. Peter clutched the tree. He slid to the ground, shaking. Instantly, Pax was on him, wriggling under his neck, licking his face, sniffing his broken foot, nuzzling his face again. 
Peter wrapped his arms around his fox and pressed his face into the piney smelling fur. You're okay, you're okay, you're okay. The vixen leaped over them to the ground and disappeared into the juniper scrub, ringing the clearing. Pack sat up and barked to her from Peter's lap. After a moment, Peter saw a black muzzle point out from the brush. Out came a skinny fox, about the size Pax had been at eight months, blinking in the sunlight. He stumbled into the clearing on three legs. The vixen reemerged. She paced and yipped at the runty little fox, shooting wary looks at Peter. Pax squirmed out of Peter's arms and barked again. The three-legged fox took a few steps closer. Its limp was so awkward. Peter realized he must have lost the leg only recently. And then he made the connection. He offered his hand and called softly. Hesitantly, his gaze darting between Peter and Pax, the little fox hobbled over. He tucked his head under Peter's chin. Peter extended a finger. The injured fox allowed him to brush his neck for an instant, then hurried back to the safety of the vixen's side. Together, the two foxes looked expectantly at Pax, and then they melted into the underbrush. And Peter understood. His fox belonged to them, and they belonged to Pax. Inseparable. All this way he'd come. All this way. Peter got to his knees. He placed his hand on Pax's back and felt the muscles jump. Peter looked around. The woods looked dangerous now, full of coyotes and bears, and soon humans at war. He looked down at his fox, still straining to follow his new family. Go, it's okay. It wasn't, though. The pain scoured him hollow, left him without breath, like a kick to the heart. He pulled his hand away, because Pax would feel a pain that deep and he wouldn't leave. Go! Pax shot away toward the brush line, then he turned back to look at his boy. Peter felt tears roll down his face, but he didn't wipe them away. Pax sprang back. He whimpered, looking at the tears. Peter pushed him down. He found the crutch and leveraged himself upright. No, I don't want you to stay. I'll always leave the porch door open, but you have to go. Pax looked toward the brush and then back at, the, back at his boy's face. Peter dug into his pocket and pulled out the toy. He lifted it. Pax raised his head, his eyes trained on Peter's hand. And Peter hurled the plastic soldier over the brush and into the woods, as far away as he could. And that's the end of the story. That always makes me emotional at the end. I always get some tears. So, a tough ending, but I think one that maybe we all knew was coming, right? So, I want you to think about why did Peter have to leave Pax? Why was that the right thing to do? Um, he had a lot of learning that he accomplished from the time he set out to look for Pax until the time he gave Pax to the wild. So, I hope you enjoyed the story. I, I know the ending's sad, but it kind of wraps up in the way we knew that it had to, right? All right. Well, we will be back after Thanksgiving with a new read aloud. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll miss seeing you all every day. Be safe. Um, if you are with family, make sure you're being as safe as possible. Okay, we don't want this virus to be any worse than it already has been. All right, love you all, miss you all. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving.